the hall, who I think was English incarnate. She had taught everyone's great grandparents and their grandparents and their parents, and now she had their children. She had no classroom management rules. It's just behavior. And I thought, in my class, I had this elaborate scheme that I had learned in my undergraduate degree. And I, and I had all this, and I was constantly having to reinforce it all the time to try to get people that didn't care about English or speech or school in general to stay on task. And she had no rules. She had no trouble. I had a bunch of rules. I had trouble all the time. And I thought, hmm, what is it I want? I want students to be able to stay on task. I want to find ways to motivate them to read their chapters and to stop bringing their knives to class. And, and you know, it's really a happy day when the drug dog doesn't alert in my class. And so there were all things that I was, I was working through, and I became very fascinated with so when I went back and I did graduate work, I did a master's degree in educational administration, but when I did my doctoral work and I focused in communication, one of the things I wanted to know is how do you use social influence in an instructional setting to create that wonderful environment that we want where everybody can learn and get excited about what we're doing? And so I began to look at social influence, and particularly I started looking at it in the context of an instructional setting. So if I were to characterize my research work and my research interests and activities over the past few years, I would say a lot of them focus on how communication works in an instructional setting to facilitate the maximum learning possible. And I'm one of those strange people that thinks that learning happens with relationships. So how do you use communication to establish relationship to encourage people to learn and to get excited about things that they don't know and to try new skills and new ideas that maybe they haven't uh, experienced before? I've also enjoyed looking at communication in terms of social influence, in terms of what makes a good department chair, what makes a good provost, what makes a good president, and so or president of a university, maybe president of a country. Don't on that one yet. <laughs> but, but in academe, what, what makes for good leadership? And how do you, do you help facilitate people to use the skills they already have and, and come together in a unified goal? And so I've been very interested in, in, in areas like that. Uh, typically, and I don't think this defines me as a researcher, but primarily the methods I've used have been quantitative in nature. I had my deep roots, the reason I was an English speech teacher is because I love literature. And that's what stirred my soul and stirred my passions. And communication in terms of the speech aspect of what I did stirred me as well. Uh, and so uh, when I began to do my research, I found that I had experimented in several different methodologies. And the one that, that kind of fit with the things that I was looking at and that I use most often uh, would be quantitative. But again, I don't think I would define myself necessarily. Oh, there's a walking down the street. On the other hand, just about everything I've done, at least in terms of uh, most of my publications have been in that particular area. What are some specific areas of my programmatic research? Some of these, social influence in a variety of settings, uh, but also specific constructs. Uh, there's a construct that, that came into communication studies and it borrows heavily from psychology and it's a construct referred to as immediacy, and it has to do with psychological closeness that we establish with other people when we're communicating, particularly in an oral setting. I've also looked at communication apprehension. I was a basic course director for public speaking for, for over 10 years. Well, public speaking and business and professional communication. Uh, and so I have been in classrooms where students got up and they were so apprehensive about giving a presentation. Uh, that they became sick of their stomach, that some of them came close to pass. I never had anybody pass out, but you know, if you've dealt with someone that has any kind of anxiety, whether it's tarantulas or giving public presentations, uh, your heart goes out to them after a while. And so I became very interested in social scientific ways of addressing high levels of anxiety, particularly in a one-to-many kind of setting. Uh, there is a construct that some of you have probably run across in, in various areas of communication literature called argumentativeness. Ransor and Infante uh, 
and kind of were some of the leading researchers in this particular area. And I was always fascinated with that. You know, when we look at argumentativeness, we think of people that are hard to get along with. But the way this was defined in the research was, no, some people just stay away from arguments. Some people love a good debate. And it's like, okay, let's have a discussion on this topic. How about I'll take this side, you take that side, and let's just see what happens. Uh, and so I've done a bit of research over the years in argumentativeness uh, and, and using that as, as something that can be helpful as opposed to verbal aggression where you denigrate another person, you insult another person, you yell at another person, you threaten other people and what have you. So having debate skills versus having just attack skills. And so I've done some, some work in that area. Uh, Dr. Rob Stewart and I have done some um, uh, publications, have completed some projects in the past on religious communication, so I'm also very interested in that as well. All right, so let's take a little walk through some research highlights. And, I'll, and I, again, uh, I just want to pick a few things and talk about some of the things that were involved in those uh, research projects may not get as excited about it as I do. Hopefully you will. Um, one of the projects I did several years ago uh, was designed to look at how teachers use that influence strategy in a classroom to promote good student hands-on uh, in terms of the materials and what have you. And what I really wanted to look at uh, was how this happens over the period of a semester. So I looked at temporal patterns and effects of perceived instructor compliance gaining use and I wanted to see how classroom management techniques over the course of a semester would relate to what you want in terms of, of classroom outcomes like student cognitive learning, student affective learning, students participation in the class and that sort of thing. And so I, it was a study that where I collected data at the very beginning of a semester and try to find out what the students thought about how the teacher was using influence strategies to, to keep the class moving and, and, and going in the right direction. And then some of their impressions about their own uh, learning at that point. And then I then we collected, I collected data again at, at midterm. And then I collected data at the end of the semester as well, same data. And so then I did comparisons between each sets of data, between all the sets of data to see what relationships. And sure enough, uh, if you have a chance to read the article, you'll notice that there were some strong relationships between how teachers chose to do social influence in a class that were positively received and had a tendency to track positively with classroom learning outcomes that are desirable all the way through the semester. What I found, though, is that some of the big correlations, and I use statistical correlations to kind of measure these, some of the biggest correlations were at the end of the semester. And what amazed me about that is that if your students are getting on your nerves and you're being professional the whole time, I have some students in a class right now that suddenly are coming to my class 10 to 15 minutes late. And I'm thinking, hmm, you've done that three or four times in a row now, so I'm sending them little emails. I couldn't help but notice you know, so I even do that now, but you know, you do that all through, through the semester, but at the end of the semester, those of you that are graduate students, you're pressured. Those of you that are faculty, you're pressured. Those of you that know your undergraduate students, they're pressured at the end of the semester as well. So everybody's nerves are raw, and then you still have classroom, why do we have to learn this, this is so, so stupid, or people talking when they're not supposed to be talking, or what have you. It was at that very time that some of the strongest relationships between teachers using more pro-social ways of managing the class had a greater impact at that time in terms of the relationship between what you did and how the students responded to it. Now, what, what excited me about those findings was that's the very time that I don't have much patience. Is you know, when I've been tried and tried and tried, it's the end of the semester, I've got so many things to do, you don't even know what you made on test one or test two, I can't see how that doesn't keep you up at night, you know, but now you're, you're wanting to come to my office hours and you want me to spend the whole weekend with you catching you up, you know, and so I'm, I have to find a very positive way of saying, you know, that, that probably can't happen, but in my office hours, we can do it for, from here to here, I do my best to help you although you don't even have a book for the class. <laughs> well, given that you have made that choice, you know, and I thought at the very time when we have the least amount of patience and we're very much pushed, that's when the relationship is the strongest 
between how that affects the student learning, their affect towards the class, their ability to, um, to, to interact with you in a positive way. So that was a research project I totally enjoyed, uh, and that's just kind of a highlight of it. Uh, now my truncates to the right, uh, but if you'll bear with me, we'll just go for that. Uh, oh, this next study I want to tell you about happened with some discussions I had with my graduate students. And I, since I was a basic course director, and I've also taught the TA graduate course, and so we, we would have a course that says, you know, if you're going to be a TA, you have to take this instructional course. And we would talk about different pedagogical theories and methods and what have you. Well, I had this argument, this running argument with the graduate students, and they said, oh, no. You, you know, I said, you need to be professional as a teacher. You need to act professionally. You need to comport yourself professionally. You need to dress professionally. That's part of being a teacher. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. We need to, we need to establish more homophily with our students. Therefore, we should come to class in our most holy jeans and our most unwashed sweats because that way we can establish a connection. So you see the research question that we have right there, all right? Is it you establish homophily and that's how you can get the maximum teacher-student effect? Or do you need to have some teacher professionalism? And I thought, oh, we are so going to collect data on this. And so I had so, to me, you could, I'm sorry, I'm getting very excited about this study. <laughs> but let me tell you what I found when I did this study. So essentially, I, and I told them, I said, you know, look, my hair, well, actually, at, this, at that time, my hair was the same color as the hair, but now it's not. Um, but I said, you know, I'm an older person, and, and I think maybe you should dress professionally. That doesn't mean you have to dress like me. You, know, you don't have to have a suit and tie. You don't have to do that. I'm just saying professional. You know, wear something that looks like a teacher. Act like a teacher. And, and so whatever that is, khakis, nice slacks, you know, whatever. You need to do that. And they said, oh, no. I said, well, let's just see. So I collected some data on this, and I wanted to show you some of the results. This is in numeric form, but I'll just show you some of the variables that I was looking at, and those of you that are interested in statistics, and I'll tell you about this, and if you're not, I'll just tell you the general things that I found. So what I wanted to look at was the effects of, of how students were attiring themselves on student affective learning, and affective learning would be how much they like the material, and they're, they're learning to, to enjoy this material. Their cognitive learning, their likelihood to misbehave in the class, things like coming late to class, talking when they're not supposed to, texting, you know, that sort of thing. And I wanted to look at SRIs. Can we do SRIs? Student ratings of instruction. I thought, I want to see if how you attire yourself as a TA has any relationship to how the students rate your instruction at the end of the semester, which we're about to do that in all of our classes, those of us that are teaching. Uh, so let me tell you, and then I thought, well, while I'm at it, I'm just going to go ahead and kind of as a comparison, I'm going to do it with, with faculty as well. And again, we're not talking about going down and dressing like you would for a wedding. I'm not talking about a tux and a long formal. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about professional that fits your discipline. So for instance, you know, if I were teaching a class on oil petroleum, and how to operate a drilling well off the coast of, of Texas, I'm probably not going to dress like this, but I would probably hopefully dress professionally. All right, so here are some of the things I found. These were just basic uh, correlations, uh, so it's just a simple correlation results. But I found that um, students, if TAs dressed more professionally, students, it, it tracked with students' affect towards a course at about a 0.5, so that's a moderate correlation. Now, in social science, that one will really preach, okay? I mean, I'm happy if it's like 0.15, you know? So the closer you get to one is a good thing, all right? And so I thought, well, look at that. Look at faculty dress. It affected, it had a tendency to track with students' uh, uh, perceptions of their affect in a faculty member's class as well. You have to understand um, that the converse of that as well. So the worse they dress, the worse scores on affect you know, now it wasn't a one-to-one -one relationship, but it tracked, and it tracked in a significant way. Cognitive learning, interestingly enough, for, TA, for TAs, it was positive and it was significant statistically. 
uh, it was even more powerful for cognitive learning with faculty dress, which I thought was fascinating. Misbehaviors, oh, this was so good. I, I have taught this with many TAs since that time and said, well, you know, I have some data that indicates this. What this says is, the more, according to the TA dress, the more professional the TAs dressed, the less likely the students were to misbehave. Now, that's a pretty low correlation, negative 0.19, but it's significant. And I thought, you know, when you're teaching, you need every little edge you can get, I think. Every little edge I can get, I want it. All right, now, for faculty, it wasn't that way. It was negative, but it wasn't significant. So talk to me, just tell me what you think about it. I'm just curious, why, do you, you know, because your explanation would probably be as good as mine, why for faculty, the better that the, they're attired, the less student misbehavior, but not as much of a relationship as it would be for TAs in the same thing, why do you think faculty, um, might be negative, but it might not be significant. Dave? I think there's something to that. I really do. I mean, an old guy is an old guy, no matter what you wear. <laughs> so it might be negative, but they may give faculty members, that's true, anything other than age that you can think of. Experience. Experience. Knowledge. You know, for, for a teaching assistant, they may not have been able to dip in the material as long as someone has been years and just been saturated in them. So I thought, you know, in some ways, it's probably not fair, but graduate students um, may not enjoy the same amount of at least perceived credibility as a professor might, uh, because the professors have been doing it for a long time, and they say, well, look, they're old, and maybe they know, I don't know, so I may give them, I still don't like it when they do X, Y, Z, but, you know, it wasn't. It wasn't a significant, but it was still in the negative direction. Oh, this last one, I thought, oh, this is wonderful. The more likely the, the professors were to dress professionally and the TAs, the more likely that their student, student ratings of instruction, which, by the way, go in our annual reports, had a tendency to be more positive. And the less, the less. And I thought, how interesting. Now, again, not talking about tuxes and formal attire. I'm just talking about professional. Whatever how that's defined, and, and I set up the study so that it could have that latitude. So who defined it as professional? Was that self self-defined? So I click like, oh, this is professional, and Sue's like, oh, it's not. Or <laughs> do the students define Excellent it? Excellent research that? question. Well, there's several different ways you can approach that. And so when I was thinking about how to do the study, I thought, well, do it this way, but here's the advantages of doing it, here's the disadvantages. So what I just did is just set it out for the students, and I said, what do you think? Rate ever how they dress on this scale from non-professional to professional. So I didn't have pictures of people, and now there were some, there were some uh, studies that came after that where they actually, actually did things like that. They'd snap a picture of somebody and say, okay, how do you respond to this? But I thought, you know, in some ways, I could dress what I thought was real professional that if the students didn't think it was, then they're going to respond to it as they think it is. So I thought, I'm going to use student, so that's an excellent question. I thought, I'm going to use student perceptions and whatever they think it is. And so if it's jeans and a press shirt or whatever, if they think that looks professional, then I'm going to let them define that because they're also the ones telling me how they're going to rate the teacher. And I saw, so I thought, I'm going to get that from now. When you use self-report and you ask students what they think, there are some disadvantages to that. There are also some advantages because they are our patrons. They are our, our, our flock that we're trying to encourage. Uh, so anyway, as you can see, I had a lot of fun with this one. I think sometimes when I show it to, to teaching assistants now that they don't want to accept it. And I'm saying, well, look, you know, I'm old. This is the costume I wear. You don't have to wear that. But as a teacher, you, know, you might want to pay attention to that. So I had a lot of fun that study. And you know, I think that's what we do as academicians. Isn't it fun when you can research stuff that you really like that actually apply to your world and that you think is important and then you research and publish it on top of that. It would be horrible if all you published was stuff you didn't care about. Now David, what's your opinion of yoga pants in first class? I've never tried them on. <laughs> I have a feeling I would be out of my own. <laughs> <laughs> even in, even in, in coach, she probably wouldn't want to wear. <laughs> <laughs> I did ask my wife the other day. I said, you know, and at, the, at 
that time I was teaching large lecture class, and I said, I could, I could look just like one of the students. I said, what if I just wore jeans and a t-shirt and I went and sat out in that middle of that large lecture class? And I said, I'll just, I'll just be like one of them. And she says, no, you don't look like <laughs> so I'm sorry to tell you that you don't look like one of them anymore. And I said, oh. I was hoping to sit out there and say incognito, say, hey, what have you heard about this teacher? <laughs> you know, I've heard he's a jerk. What have you heard? He's hard. And then get up and teach the class. I thought that would be so fun. But I don't know if I could pull that out with jeans, much less with yoga pants. <laughs> Actually, somebody would probably call security. I did another study. You know, uh, I interacted with some graduate students and I taught the graduate teaching class. And so we talked about theory and we talked about research and immediacy, verbal and nonverbal immediacy, and a variety of different concepts. Uh, we talked about how to make tests. We talked about how to grade tests. We talked about a whole variety of things that not just all of us know just because we were born. I certainly didn't. And so we talked about that. And so I had a student that uh, went overseas and went to Germany. And he emailed me. He said, you know, Dr. Roach, all that stuff that you told us about communication in classrooms and stuff, I'm in Germany, it doesn't work over here. And I said, well, maybe that's because you're in another culture. Hmm. And I said, hey, how would you like to gather some data while you're over there? And he said, well, okay. And so I gathered some instructional data over there. We translated it into German. We back translated it. Just, I mean, if you ever use a little translator thing online and you say something and you go, oh, that's how you say it in this. And It'd be very suave and send that to somebody else. But if you never send it back the other way, you really need to do that. Because it'll translate it one way, and then when you translate it back, it may say something completely different. And so that's why, as a research methodology, we translated it into German and tra back translated it from German back into English to make sure that our instruments were, were sufficiently and accurate. And so then uh, he got it that data over there. And I gathered some data over here and then did a comparative study, and it was wonderful. I took it to a conference, you know, published it in one of our top ranked journals. And when I was at the conference, somebody else was there, and they said, Wow, that was really interesting. I have some contacts in France. Hmm, wonder if we could collaborate. I said, Sure. So we did one with France. One of the interesting things in both of these studies is I got to study higher education and as, as a preparation that, not only did I look at Hofstede's cultural dimensions and things like that, but I also got to look at higher ed in those countries and how it was operated. And studying French culture and studying French higher educational history was fascinating. And I thought in a culture that politically may be more on a progressive side, if you look at how they operate their higher ed, it is not, you know, go talk to your professor. It's very more authoritarian. It's more hey, this is the way it is, you know, I have my education, you know, work hard and get yours, but it wasn't as much of the back and forth as we're familiar with in the American model, which I thought was fascinating. And so, when we did this research, they, we translated the instruments into French, and translated it, back translated, and then I did some, some data collection over here, and then entered that all and began to analyze that. Here were some of the things that we came up came up with results wise, and again, I apologize for just throwing numbers at you, but let's think about what they mean, because uh, to me that's the richness. Numbers for numbers sake don't mean anything. But here are the variables uh, that we were looking at in the study. I wanted to look at on the left hand side what teachers do communicatively to establish positive relationship with their students. Uh, this particular instrument I used was something in the literature that referred to affinity seeking. So it was an affinity seeking type of instrument that measure, what does the teacher do to try to establish positive relationship with the students? Now, I will, I, will, I will be very, the first to tell you, I don't think a teacher's job necessarily is to be liked, but I sure don't think it hurts. <laughs> you know, and I think you're gonna have, once you establish a relationship with someone and it's on a positive basis, then sometimes that builds a bridge for facilitation of learning. And so again, just because you're difficult or rigorous and the student doesn't like that, I don't apologize.
helps us for that. But in this particular variable, I wanted to look at what teachers use to establish po positive relationship with students. I also wanted to look at teacher nonverbal immediacy. What do teachers do nonverbally to establish a sense of psychological closeness, or as Kenneth Burton might say, identification, a consubstantiation, if you will, uh, with their students so that you can build that bridge across which students can travel with relationship and hopefully with learning. I also wanted to look at how, the, how teachers would use influence strategies and various types of influence strategies, like do this or you'll flunk. Or do this because I've found if you do it this way, you're more likely to get published or whatever. So there's a lot of different approaches with that. So I looked at that, we looked at that in American students, and then we looked at that over in France as well. And these are just simple correlations. So this is not uh, path analysis or a lot of different things you can do statistically. But I thought the results were very interesting because they show that pedagogy in the US is in some ways similar to other cultures and in some ways not and so you can't just be a good communicator as a teacher in one culture and assume that if you go to another culture and do the exact same thing that you're going to get positive results so let's just look at a few of those you'll notice like for instance teachers and, and again I asked for student perceptions of what they thought uh, teachers in USA classrooms and uh, classrooms in the States that had more were perceived more to use more affinity promoting uh, communication statements and, and activities. Notice the student ratings of instruction correlated with that. Uh, that's a that's a fairly on the top end of moderate size correlation. So essentially, what that says is it has a tendency when teachers do that. It has a tendency to positively track with their course evaluations. Essentially. All right. Notice in France, still you have that pattern. All right. So cognitive learning, cognitive learning, you have that pattern. Nonverbal immediacy, and again, that's a psychological closeness. In America, uh, you had some good positive correlations. Interestingly enough, in France, they're positive, but they're not as high. And I actually did some post hoc analysis where I would say. I want to compare the strength of these two relationships. Is this one significantly different than this one over here? And there were actually some interesting differences. This, the how teachers use power strategies or influence strategies, classroom management strategies. To me, this one was fascinating. If you'll notice in the U.S., any power strategies you use, sometimes they work fairly well, particularly with uh, you know, please. Please go ahead and do it this way. You know, I'd like for you to use MLA style because I have found that that is really helpful when you do your manuscripts or whatever. And I have found that. So that's kind of an expert appeal. You see what I'm saying? Uh, in, in American classrooms, there was a positive correlation, significant, between use of that and affective learning, cognitive learning, and student ratings of instruction. Look in France. Ah, in France, whether or not you ask them to do something as an expert or not didn't really affect how they liked, it, liked you or the class. All right? Although there was a relationship between cognitive learning and student ratings and instruction. One of the most fascinating ones, though, look at coercion power. This is when a teacher threatens the students. You do this, and I will punish you in this way. I will make sure you never get a job. I hope teachers don't do that. But if they did, you see how that would be a very negative type of thing? You do that with with students in this culture, and they will rise up against you. They will so bow up against you. And I was kind of surprised that it wasn't significant all across the board, but notice at least for affect towards the teacher, they're gonna have a tendency not to like you if that's your style, all right? And they're gonna have a tendency to rate you lower on your course evaluations if that is your style. Look in France, huh. it's not significant. So you can use coercion power all you want in a French classroom, and it doesn't bother them. Ha! Huh. Not only that, but there is a positive correlation between using coercion power and their perceptions of their cognitive learning. And I thought, well, that goes right past me. And do you see how egocentric we get in our own cultures? To me, I'm just thinking, I cannot believe that. That is amazing. 
And then you have to step back just a little bit and say, who goes to college in America and who goes to college in France? Hmm. Well, if you look at in Germany, and you look at France, and you look at uh, any of the UK systems, you'll find that a lot of times they do university differently than we do. Only the creme de la creme get to university if you think about it. You know, you take tests in junior high and elementary, and if you don't pass that test, you go off to the trade school that, that happens at that particular level. In our culture, it's not that way. You know, we hope that we can get everybody in. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And in France, though, you can be coercion, and it doesn't use coercion power, and it doesn't really affect them because they think, well, my teacher's being really autocratic, but I'm here to get my education, so okay, whatever. And I thought, how interesting. So you can see I get very excited <laughs> about some of the results of this. I, I have, just moving on, in, in recent years, I, I thought in scholarship there were several colleagues, and, and we knew each other, and we thought, well, hey, what if we wrote a textbook? I thought, well, that was an interesting venture. I thought, oh, how hard could it possibly be? Just write it down and put a few cartoons in it. It would be great. Oh, my word. I had no idea how difficult. And you're saying, well, hey, I've written a scholarly book. Well, I would call this a scholarly book, but not on the same level as maybe Kenneth Burke's you know, rhetoric of motives or whatever. But um, it was quite a project. But we collaborated, and it's in its second edition. It's on training and development, using communication and training and development settings. So it was a delight to write. Uh, I learned, I thought I knew how to write. Uh, I had to change my style for doing a textbook. So I thought that was interesting. And I'll just tell you a little aside. I didn't realize, in case there were any of you who were interested, I've always thought Calvin and Hobbes cartoons were wonderful. And, and so I thought, if I write a textbook on Calvin and Hobbes, I'll do that book. And then I found out you had to pay for them. <laughs> I didn't know that. And then I thought, well, if I ever write a textbook, I'm going to put pictures all in it because I think students need pictures. And then I found out, you have to pay for every one of those. And I said, don't worry, I have a phone. I'll take my own pictures. You have to buy your pictures. And so there's a picture. I feel like if you ever get to look at it. There's a picture on one page where it talks about assessment or something. And it's got a picture of a Scantron and a pencil. And I can tell you how much we had to pay for that. And I'm thinking, oh, heavens, really? So anyway. Uh, I got to experience that part of scholarship, and, and, and uh, hopefully we'll have a new edition at some point. We'll look at that as well. Um, working with graduate students, I find very, very rewarding because they come up with ideas that I didn't think about. And so this particular um, publication here came from a graduate student that was in my quantitative research methods course. And in that course, I require them to come up with everything but their data or a quantitative research project. So I want everything. I want the lit review. I want you to have your questions. We're going to iron all that stuff out. And the only thing, because we don't have time to do it, is that you don't have time to collect data. But it, when you leave this class, you can say, I'm done with this, never again. Or you've got it all set up. All you have to do is go through the IRB, collect your data, and you get a publication. You've got a conference paper or whatever. Well, one of the students actually did that and turned it into her dissertation. And so she wanted to look at communication apprehension and writing apprehension uh, in the ag communications area of different colleagues. So uh, it, was, it was nice to work on that project with her as well. Uh, just some conference papers and presentations, just a few, and then I'll, I'll open up the floor in just a bit for any questions you may have. Um, I have found that in my administrative capacity that, that maybe I can apply some of my research skills and maybe my scholarship interests uh, in those areas. As well, and so Gary Elba and I uh, presentation at an assessment conference, and so I thought that was was a very interesting conference. That was a delight to write that paper. Uh, I'm I'm big into assessment. Uh, I really think as as a teacher, it's very important to continually assess what you're doing so you can get better at it and reach students. That's your whole purpose in the classroom. Um, so I'm also interested in the program. In 2015, I was invited to give a presentation at the Texas Speech Communication Association. Uh, and so I gave a presentation on, on C.S. Lewis, which is one of my favorite uh, authors, and so I enjoyed that. Uh, this last conference, I was able to assemble a panel of people. And we looked at lessons from C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien 
in leadership, academic leadership. And so my particular paper was on uh, lessons uh, from Lord of the Rings on administrative leadership as service, not as dictatorial ruling, but as service. Uh, other presentations in there um, had to do with uh, Frodo Baggins as an example of leadership. Uh, Sam Wise Gamgee was in this presentation, not in mine, but in another. So what I, what was so neat about this particular panel is I tried to find administrators who had been in the field for a long time and also who had an affinity for C.S. Lewis or J.R. Tolkien. So that's how we put the panel together. So my part was this. Oh, it's a delicious panel. For those of you that are interested in C.S. Lewis, I know a scholar at Texas State University who's one of the premier scholars in C.S. Lewis, and he brought an original book that hardly anybody else knew about in the science goes to Oxford all the time. He has found things that nobody knew that CS did, you know, little notes or something that was in the library somewhere. I don't know why they couldn't find something, but I guess that library is older than our country, so maybe that's why <laughs> they don't know some things are there, and they don't just let anybody walk up and down the roads either. So anyway, that was a delightful presentation. I also was able to give a presentation at, the Nash, at my last national research conference on political influences in higher ed and how those show up in assessment. And I, you know, I don't know how excited anybody else in the room was about the paper, but I, I was really excited about it because if you look around and you think, why do we have to do all this assessment? What does it mean? And who's looking at it? What could this possibly have to do with our departmental budgets or how higher ed gets funded? Oh, it is amazing if you take a look at what's actually pulling some of the strings behind all this. We want to do it because we want to be quality educators. We want to have quality programs. Other people do it for other reasons. And so I enjoyed being able to participate. And there were several other people on that panel as well. Uh, I have some, some materials uh, submitted for the nas next national conference that, 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 I'll, uh, that I'm familiar with, the National Communication Association Conference. So we'll see if it hits. Uh, we submitted, I submitted a panel. Uh, my particular area is going to be on communication research and training. There will be some other panelists, hopefully, if we get programmed, uh, that will have some different aspects on that. So those are some conference presentations. And finally, let me just tell you about some current research I'm doing and then some research that I have my eyes on. Uh, and then I'll just open it up for any questions that you may have. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I have a current project that I'm looking at looks at nonverbal communication in a classroom setting, you have the data gathered, the data is entered, all I need to do is analyze it, so it's at that point. Um, I'm also participating with two, well, with one graduate student in CMLL and another person who is actually out. Uh, and we're looking at a joint project on international communication, well, communication apprehension in international teaching. Can you imagine going to another country and teaching in another language that is not your own? Oh heavens, call it to China and somebody said, hey, how's your Mandarin? Ah, you know, and, and yet we have a lot of international students in our programs. And can you imagine the communication or instructional apprehension they might have? Not only that, but they run into uh, level, notice that, that part of that has to deal with undergraduate comprehension of their teaching. Uh, and in my office, and I bet you've heard this as well, students will say, ah, I had this class, I can't even understand the TA, they're not American, I can't understand what they're saying. Why am I paying money for this? <laughs> and then the chancellor's office gets calls on that, and then they write it back down through us, and we have to track that out. Well, as you can imagine, that probably happens on a spectrum. You probably have some international TAs that cannot be understood at all. You have some of them that are understood very well, but the local culture says, hmm, you're not from around here, are you? And then there's some where they have a bit of an accent, but if you just try a little, it's not that hard. So, you know, there's probably a range of that. So we have to track that down all the time in our office. Typically, it's not the humanities. Typically, it will be in STEM disciplines that we run across that. And sometimes the students you know, are, are crying wolf and then other times they have a legitimate concern. You know, this, this teacher never faces the class. They just run on the talking to them. So, that sort of thing. And 
so this particular study is wanting to look at that sort of thing. You know, students being able to understand them, but also their apprehension levels when they come over here. Uh, in our culture, we expect the teaching assistants to come and visit. In other cultures, they may not be that out front, and what might be apprehension from them might be perceived by American students as being stuffy, I don't care about you, what have you. On the other hand, they come from other cultures. <laughs> I was in the computer grading center the other day, and I met a delightful graduate student from Iran, and, and we got to visiting, and, and she said, I don't understand why American students like they skip my class. I don't understand. Do they have the, does the government pay for this? And I said, no, we do. We have to pay for it. So in her culture, the government would subsidize the well, I actually pay for it to go to the University of Tehran. And she said, well, why don't they come to class? And she said, and they, they sit there and text on their phones during class. I don't understand that. And then I'm having to say, well, I wish I knew the answer to that. It may be a maturity thing in our culture. In your culture, you're not going to see that. But then I also thought in her culture, not everybody goes to university either. I didn't say that. But I thought, how interesting, you know, when you look at different cultures. So those are some things I'm doing right now. I continue to be interested in communication and leadership. I have some ideas in that area. I've really, for a long time, I wanted to, to look at communication and help. One of the most difficult things in doing that, though, is that they're busy, and they, you think FERPA uh, rules are, are something that we need to abide by, but wait till you get to HIPAA and medical records and all that. So I have some dreams and some goals, and have actually taken some steps toward trying to make a foray into that area and look at communication principles, because frankly, most of you have been to doctors that were really good communicators, and others of them, and you went to physicians, and then you think, oh, hell, it's whatever you don't do just as an interaction specialist, we don't treat our patients that way. This is how you should do this, you know, what have you. So I really wanted to do that, and I continue to be interested in religious communication uh, as well as a research area. So, you have been very patient, and I've been talking for a long time. What questions do you have for me that, that, that you might have about what I do and what my interest is? Can yes, you talk sir. more about your dreams and uh, looking at communication and health context? I'm, I'm curious what, that, what your ideas are. Ah, well, okay. I'll give you a few. Uh, we had a daughter that was very sick for many, many years, and so we went to every doctor in Texas. You mentioned ended up at Mayo Clinic. And I found myself as a concerned parent in that whole uh, journey that was several years long. But I also found myself looking at the One of the things that I thought about the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, it is the most organized communicative organization I have ever seen. They put our registration uh, procedures to shame. You walk in there, they meet you at the airport. You go see one clinic doctor, and they say, oh, here's your schedule for the day. Well, we've changed it. They come find you wherever you are in this big city of, of buildings, and they say, here's your new schedule. I've never seen anything like it. And I thought, just the organization of that. So some of my interests or how could we possibly do that and hire it and learn from that? Uh, and so I have an interest in kind of at an organizational communication level. I also, also have an interest in this. I did some research that is in my CV that I didn't talk about today uh, about uh, teacher communication apprehension. Uh, you know, most of the time you think, well, if you have communication apprehension, why in the world do you want to be a teacher? Because guess what you do all that? You stand up in front of people. It's one to many. Why would you want to do that? Well, most people that really have high apprehension in those areas would never do that, but TAs do. Why? Some of the reason they do is because they want to get their degree, and this is how they can subsidize their degree is to become a TA, especially if you're here internationally. Where else can you get a job? There's some rules about where they can get jobs. So years ago, I actually did some studies on, you know, what happens when you have international TAs that have high levels of communication and apprehension? Huh. My thought is that that happens in medical settings. Just because they're a doctor does not mean that they have a uh, lack of anxiety. And frankly, if I had to walk out of surgery and tell somebody their loved one wasn't going to make it, can you imagine the anxiety that's in that? Um, and so I wanted to look at communication anxiety in medical settings. 
and see how that affects doctor-patient relationships. I uh, see how that affects patient status. You know, if, if you know anything about the medical profession now, they're they're all getting into the same uh, ratings of care that we do. You know, how how satisfied were you with your visit? And here's a coupon. Here's a coupon for your next tetanus shot. You know, I don't know. I haven't seen one of those yet. But, you know, they're really going towards this patient satisfaction business. And so I would love to get right in the middle of that and say, part of that patient satisfaction business may have to do with your communication, not just the pills you're prescribing. Because I'm convinced that some of the medical practice has to do with your relationship with the patient. And maybe some of the healing comes from that as well. Anyway, you can see you touched the nerve. I could go on, but I'll, I'll stop with that. But thank you for asking. Those are just some dreams I have so far. Mm, yes? Question. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this notion of trying to understand the relationships between teachers and instructors and students. I'm interested if you know about how NPI has been translated into online contexts course everybody in this room is working in hybrid spaces and working in um, sometimes purely digital spaces do you have ideas about how we might study uh, or design a, a, a study that's to, such to a rich area in the non-verbal immediacy literature I've seen there's not been much work done in that so it is ripe. it is totally right uh, to me you would have to look at okay is it a synchronous setup or no synchronous one of the things that people look at in immediacy, they'll look at what's called verbal immediacy. You could do that real easily in a, in a distance online format. In a synchronous online format, I really think you could do this some of the others. There's, there's going to be a little distance about them not being there, but if they're all popped up on the screen and we're having a synchronous interaction, you can still get facial, you know, you may not get full body involvement, but you can get tonality, you can get a whole bunch of other stuff. So I think that's a very ripe area, I really do, and I haven't seen a lot of work in it. Some, but not a bunch. And are emojis part of NPI? Like, is that, or is that... Why is not? That, is that textual, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Iconic. Yeah, right. Iconic NPI. I think that's very fascinating. So, I think that would be a very good area. I don't think one would be, at least in journals that I read, I've seen tons of stuff which tells me it hasn't been mined. And frankly, with what we do nowadays, it needs to be mined. What else? Yes. David, you do a lot of, uh, you know, obviously a lot of statistical work, and I think it would be really helpful if you could supplement teaching that or science or, or research. Do you typically do that yourself, or do you just outsource it to somebody? The statistical work? Yeah. Oh, if I run across something, I can't figure out. I'll ask somebody else to do it. But. I usually do my own, and, and, and you know, typically, when you boil it all down statistically, you're saying, look, are these things related if a little bit differently than by chance, or are these things a little bit different you know, um, because of design or something's going on than just random? And so I typically do my own. Now, I do have some dreams of doing some studies, and I know what I want done, and I may say, you know, I'm going to have to go talk to somebody about that one. Here's conceptually what I'm trying to do. Can you show me how to do that? But you know, there are ways you can find it. I usually do my own. So you can. Yeah, I use there's an SPS that on this campus you can use SPSS, which is statistical package for social sciences, and our SAS, social for statistical analysis systems. I don't know what the SAS was. Uh, so I just I use SPSS. Related to that, in terms of teaching, what do you know? What the uh, you came over, you'd be in our, in our department, but you'd be primarily still working with these on how that would work out. Or, or well, I don't know. You know, we could talk about that probably in the next session a little bit more. But you know, I think um, there would be an administrative component to my responsibilities with the ability of teaching. Um, and right now, I do administration and I teach. Uh, I'm not the teaching. Did we get? It's like the 
the dementors are familiar with Harry Potter. There are dementors in administration. They suck out all the life and goodness of your soul. And after a while, you go into teaching and you get out your Patronus. Uh, how, do you keep, how do you keep that up? And it, and it feeds your, your life. And but when you stand up and announce it, the, the students' names at graduation, everybody wakes up. Hey, come on down. And, you know, to me, let's be excited that they accomplished well, I can tell all of you have been sitting for a long time, an hour, a long time ago. Don't make people sit too long. Right. So we have four minutes. So would you like to go early in four minutes, or is there something burning that we need to still talk about? I'm guessing the graduate students are going to see you again in a few minutes, and so we can probably just adjourn now and see you in the next discussion. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. We're staying. I just thought we could probably just uh, circle up. Circle up. Yeah.